Good afternoon. Well, that's a quiet audience. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Okay, there we go. Now, when it comes to electronics, I'm the village idiot, and uh, everywhere I've gone, everyone knows this. So I might have to ask you to move over a little bit, because I've got to do the button. And my fervent prayer is that the button actually works. Yes, it does. Okay. Now, you can see what I want to talk about um, this afternoon for the time that I have is reading Latinamente. And what does that mean to read the Bible, the Old Testament, as a Latino scholar? And I'm going to explain all that. And I'm doing this uh, with you here, and this is jumping. But I want to talk a little bit about the light show that I'm offering you today. Um, maybe, there we go. Okay, I'm showing you two pictures here, because what you need to know is that I'm half Guatemalan. My mother was Guatemalan, and so we were raised bilingual and bicultural. Um, the thing is, I'm half Guatemalan, and, and Guatemalans are short, so there's a major disconnect here. Um, my mother was five foot four, my dad was five eleven, my older brother's five foot six. There was a genetic mistake uh, somewhere in the <laughs> in the genetic pool. Uh, but this is how I was raised. Uh, we would go every summer to Guatemala. Uh, my grandmother would come up uh, every year and spend months with us. And I would be put in school in Guatemala during the summers. And that helped me with the language and the culture <clears throat> and um, became very much a part of, of who I am. And so as you see here, on the left, what you see is the National Palace. Uh, all these Latin American cities are built the same. It goes back to the Spanish conquest where you'll have the central square, La Plaza Central. You'll have the cathedral, which would be over here somewhere, and then the government buildings, and here's the National Palace. This is the environment within which I was raised. I was raised Roman Catholic of the Latin American sort, which is very medieval uh, in terms of processions and Mary and all those things. Um, that's my background. And when I was a little boy, I went through the stage that Catholic boys all used to go through, not now maybe, but I wanted to be a priest. <clears throat> so I memorized the mass and all this kind of stuff. That's my background. And over here you see La Antigua Guatemala. And this is the old colonial capital of Central America. And these are part of my roots. This is part of, of who I am, very deep uh, who I am. But there's another part of Guatemala that will show up uh, in due time. We're getting there. Maybe someone can sit there and do the buttons because this is not working properly, okay? If you can do the two photos that come up. Because as all countries, even this one, there's a dark side. Um, you will see here two pictures. And one of them is talking about the poverty in, in, in Latin America and Guatemala in particular. And here, uh, the war. Uh, Guatemala began its civil war in 1960 and it did not get finished until 1996. Um, we estimate 200,000 dead and one million displaced. Uh, that explains uh, in the past the amount of immigrants from Guatemala that make their way uh, north. About 400 uh, indigenous villages disappeared. Uh, the army was trained in Vietnam tactics of a scorched earth policy, and uh, the way you do war is you eliminate um, populations. And that's what we saw in Guatemala. I remember as a boy uh, hearing machine gun fire and bombs going off and soldiers and being frisked. It was just part of what life was. And this was true uh, when I went to teach in Guatemala all those years. When I go to Guatemala <coughs> um, to be a professor, um, it's the height of the um, the civil wars in Latin America. The Sandinistas are in uh, Nicaragua. Uh, which was the great socialist experiment outside of Cuba. And actually, to get to Costa Rica, where I went with my wife so she could learn Spanish, there was a language school there, we had to drive through Sandinista, Nicaragua. It's a day drive. We crossed the Honduranian border. And uh, this is the middle of the Revolución, right? And so everyone's dressed in you know, military fatigues and very serious, La Revolución. And so it was also the time of the Contra War. So, um, they give you a soldier to drive. And so it was, I was driving, and my wife, the uh, young woman from the uh, Houston suburbs, and uh, uh, a Nicaraguan soldier. 
which to me was very normal, because uh, I grew up with that kind of stuff. Uh, but my poor wife uh, was <laughs> duly shocked. But I'm telling you all this because this will help explain who I am. This is part of, of the journey. Because at that time, what you would find in Latin America was what is now called liberation theology. And what began to enter my mind was, what would an evangelical alternative to that look like? With a commitment to the scripture, but a commitment to the context as well. What would that look like? How would you do it? How could you be true to the text and the gospel, but also true <clears throat> to this? This would lead me into the field of Old Testament social ethics, which is uh, a primary field of mine. It explains why I work in Amos, because my idea was, what would be a book that could respond to this? And the book of Amos came quickly to mind. And it also got me thinking about how do you do contextual biblical studies? When I come back to the U.S., the issues are a war. Um, this was during the time of the wars the U.S. was involved in, in Iraq, for instance. Uh, and immigration. Um, and this, I, this is what I write about. I've been speaking and writing on immigration now and the Bible for over a decade. Um, and that's part of, uh, of who I am, too. You see, why do I speak on immigration? Because uh, I mean, this is, these are my people. And, um, and when I came back to the U.S. and I would hear Christians talking about immigration, they weren't talking as Christians. Uh, they were talking uh, according to their political persuasion, left or right, and they could go find some verses. <laughs> um, and that's what got me into that topic. And so even though it means extra work and time, uh, es por mi gente, this is what you do. So this is part of, of, of who I am and part of my journey. Uh, and the thing that's kind of odd, uh, and some of you may be from mixed heritage like me, is that I, I, I tell people, you know, the gringos, the anglos, um, don't understand me, because I, I look like Anglo, right? Uh, and then the Latinos don't believe me, because I'm too tall. I mean, so I'm screwed either way. I mean, <laughs> But the, the, the thing that, in God's grace, I think what he's done is helped me, uh, hopefully, to be some kind of bridge. So let me get into the next topic of this, which is, what does it mean to read the Bible Latinamente? And the first thing I want to mention is, are what I would call the contextual realities. And what you have in, if you can do the first one, uh, is this idea of a collective identity. There is something that bridges all of Latin America. Latin America is very diverse. Multiple races and mixes of races uh, that go back to the pre-Spanish time of the indigenous peoples, the, the Aztec, the Maya, the Inca. What you also have are the descendants of African slaves who were brought in into the Caribbean once the local populations had been decimated by war and disease. The Spanish and the Portuguese will import black slavery uh, from Africa. This is why if you look at the Atlantic coast of Central America and the northern sweep of, of South America, you'll find a lot of blacks. Uh, these are descendants of slaves, uh, and, and the Portuguese would do it their own way. And this is why Brazil has a large black population. And then you have all the mixtures in between. So this is incredible racial diversity in Latin America. There's, there's linguistic diversity uh, all the, in Guatemala alone. There are 22 different indigenous languages. I'm not talking dialects, I'm talking languages. Now, there's Spanish kind of rules uh, across the continent, but there is that diversity of language and diversity of history and, and culture. But at the same time, there are things that unite us, and part of it is Spanish. And so I saw my Dominican brother, uh, Cesar, sitting over here by himself. And I knew just looking at him, okay, this is un hermano latino. So I came over and said, you're by yourself. Come to our table. You see, because we have something in common. First thing he says, how do you know Spanish? <laughs> okay, again, okay. <laughs> I get it. But that immediately connects us. Oh, my mother, Guatemala, oh. I... So what you begin to see then, that there are things that cross. You know, the music, the concept of family, um, the food, some of it, it's all very different too, but this is why, uh, even though I didn't put it up here, there's something in, in Latino... Uh, biblical and theological studies, is, is calling working in conjunto, which means you work together. Uh, maybe you'd see this in the black um, uh, African American African American tradition too, but they have just kind of, the collaboration is a natural kind of thing, uh, because we're all in this together, because you're doing it not just for yourself, you're doing it for your people. 
So that takes me to the next piece, which is lo cotidiano. And the cotidiano means the daily things. La vida cotidiana is daily life. And this is what uh, biblical studies and theology is about. Because now it's not just about a degree and something abstract. The idea is if theology can't speak to this, it should not speak. This will get you into social issues. Uh, it'll get you into other disciplines. And so what you find in uh, Latino biblical studies is a natural move to multidisciplinary work. You can't begin to speak to lo cotidiano if you don't do some sociology. You understand it better if you know some anthropology. You see, you know it better if you, if you know some history. And now what you begin to do very naturally out of lo cotidiano is begin to deal with those issues because the conversations are different. Uh, even as, as, as here at Southeastern, which I don't know is my first time here, how do you recruit Latinos? Get to know the grandmother. <laughs> the grandmother holds it together. And you need to get the grandmother and the mother on campus. That, that's just how it works, if they're close. Um, there are certain things and sounds and, and music um, and family issues that are very unique and, and very, very deep. Um, you know, it's like, uh, I love uh, Latin music, and you know, Latin love songs are so much, you can't do this in English. It's in Spanish. And there's just a rhythm, you know. Uh, it's, the, it's the language and the music of the heart, you see. So when you're talking about lo cotidiano, you're not only talking about a topic, you're talking about something that's so deep because it is who we are. And the next thing is the idea of um, the church as the primary context. Um, if you ever were Latin American, I was raised Roman Catholic, uh, it's so deep. Uh, my mother, as uh, she was dying, you know, kind of goes back to her Catholic faith. And uh, we had brought her up to Denver uh, until she died. This is what we do. We take care of our parents in our home um, until they pass. You know, we did. But we go back to Houston, my brother and I, and we're going through her things. And what you have are bidikinis, virgins, right? It's part of. And so I took two. One's in my bedroom, our bedroom, and one's in my office at home. Not for any kind of worship, but it's my mother. <laughs> the statue's not my mother, but it brings me my mother and my culture. These things are so deep. And so the church, the Catholic church, is very deep uh, in ways that would make no sense to, to Americans. Um, and so the evangelical faith down there, uh, you know, it's, 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 you do things in the church, with the church, for the church, in ways that would be very strange. And then when you talk about immigrant churches in this country, <coughs> the, in, the immigrant church becomes the replacement of the extended family. And so at the church, you'll find people talking about jobs, when I was a member of a church, uh, Iglesia del Camino in, in Denver, um, you would have families that would be talking about if your father gets taken away and deported, uh, who's going to take care of the children? Those are the conversations you have in a Latino church. A sermon on be sure you drive the speed limit because you don't want to be stopped. Um, okay, uh, you know, you don't have the, 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 um, the right paperwork, so they don't even have to give you minimum wage, but if you don't show up on a Sunday, um, you'll be replaced. When I was coming in from the airport, I was seeing all the landscapers. Who were they? Latinos. You see, that's just classic. These are the conversations of the church, and the church now becomes the center of life and protection and sharing in a strange land. You can see how this will just take you in different directions. Which is the next point, which is the idea of a responsible reading. Because now it's not, not just about um, the data. Interpretation matters. Because you do it for a people. African Americans understand this. 
It's not only about orthodoxy, you can't even biblically talk about orthodoxy without talking about orthopraxis. Those are the kind of buzzwords. But what happens when you, you, you make those choices, and there are choices that you make, there is a cost to be paid um, because of those commitments. So I have to work twice as hard because not only do I have to work for my people, but I have to convince the Anglo audience that what I'm saying is legit, which means extra hours, extra assignments that you take on, extra projects, because if I don't do the Amos work, they won't give me the time of day. Because it's very easy. Oh, you're the immigration guy, right? And that's how they silence you. There's a cost to be paid. But as you get older in this, and this is what, you know, Miguel would understand this, how do I bring others along with me? So I talked to publishers. I, I mentioned, you know, there's this guy at Southeastern, Miguel Echeverria, good New Testament scholar. I need to talk to him. There's a guy at Southern, Dominique Hernandez, brilliant Puerto Rican, uh, PhD from Bar Ilan in Israel, ancient or Eastern specialist. You see. So the cost is not only your, what you have to do in your own life, but now you're working in conjunto with the others, and let's do this together. So this is kind of the framework, okay? How do you do good Old Testament work? Do all the exegesis and the parsing of the verbs, and you line it up with ancient or eastern stuff and Old Testament discussions, and then you do it responsibly. So let me give you some examples of reading Latinamente. Click. There we go. And then some examples. <laughs> examples. Um, let me tell you some biblical stories. And let me just give it to you through uh, an immigration lens. And you all are PhD students, right? Some of you, I'm, I've heard, are, are systematic theology students. Some are you New Testament. Any Old Testament? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, may your tribe increase. Uh, <laughs> Abram. You know the story, Genesis 11, right? He, he leaves uh, Ur of the Chaldees and goes up to Haran, the extended family, and then he'll come down into Canaan, chapter 12. He receives the promise in verses 1 to 3, and uh, it's really very good. <coughs> he responds very well. You know, he builds altars and calls on the name of God. Oh, very good. But you read a few verses in, and there's a famine in the land. So they begin to go to Egypt. Egypt, of course, has the Nile. There's water, there's crops. And if you, if you look at a satellite picture, you, you know, everything's brown, but there's this green strip. Right? That's the Nile. And so in ancient history, this is what the Egyptians were always dealing with, people coming in looking for food. And so this is what Abram and Sarai do. We also know that the Egyptians had, had set up a series of forts on their eastern frontier to monitor people coming in and how many to get in. I mean, this is classic. This is just what humans do. So we wonder, was he coming up to one of these outposts, the checkpoints? As they get closer, you know how the story goes. If they ask you, tell them that you're my sister and not my wife. Step back for a second. He says there that he's trying to save his own neck. But you see, if they don't lie, to get across the border, they starve. She is willing to take the risk as the woman of being taken in to Pharaoh's harem so that they can eat. Desperate people do desperate things to survive. And so I remember when I was at seminary decades ago, Rooker, where's Mark? <clears throat> decades ago, they're trying to explain, you know, did Abram lie? And let's talk about what lying means. Like, no, these are migrants desperate to eat. The only choice is to go back into the desert and die. Have you thought of that story? It's an immigrant story. Or Joseph, forced migration, right? Sold, 
ends up at Potiphar's house. He's hardworking and honest. He ends up being, you know, the steward of the home. And the, the, the man leaves, Potiphar leaves, and then she tries to seduce him, and he runs away. Who do you think the Egyptian authorities are going to believe? The Egyptian woman or the foreigner? He's the one who goes to jail. He can interpret dreams. He comes out. They give him an Egyptian name. Just read the text. They give him an Egyptian wife. But when his children, his two sons, are born, he gives them Israelite names. He's not forgotten who he is. His brothers come looking for food. There it is. And as they come, and they can't recognize him, but if you know the ancient Near East, you would know that he would have shaved and painted himself according to the stature of his, of his, of his position. That's why they can't recognize him. But he knows what they're saying. But he has an interpreter. He goes behind the curtain and he weeps. You see, he never forgot his mother tongue. He was bilingual. He was bilingual. And a lot of us are. Some are bilinguals. Y si ustedes quieren con mucho gusto, sin pena, les doy esto en español del corazón. I can do this either way you want. And there's Joseph, the bilingual forced migrant. You thought about it this way? And then he says, you know, when I die, take my bones home. There's something deep about home. And then we know that, uh, this is interesting, you know, family reunification, even if you think about Joseph, his family reunification, Jacob comes with all the other brothers. And this well-placed migrant is able to save his family on the delta. But we know it says that the Egyptians despised shepherds. And what was his dad? And so he presents his father, Jacob, to the Pharaoh. What was he thinking, Joseph? Was, was it embarrassing? Was he humiliated? And then you see this old man walk over and bless the most powerful man on the planet. The irony of God's story. Have you thought of Joseph as an immigrant story? It's all over the place. The yearnings, the embarrassments perhaps, the bilingual. He's able to move in both worlds. That's Miguel, isn't it? Cubano American. He even speaks Spanish with a Cuban accent. We're working on that. <laughs> hermano Cubano. That's how he'd say it. We would say Hermano Cubano. Hermano Cubano. It sounds funny, but that's him. <laughs> Here's another one. Ruth, Ruth's easy, but is it? The story begins with famine in the land. This is a recurring theme in that part of the world. There's no water oftentimes. It affects crops, and there's no food. So Naomi and her family become immigrants, and they go to Moab. And the two sons marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. That is, these Moabite women marry immigrant men. But the husband dies, and the two young men die, and so now you have three widows. And uh, Naomi you know, says, you know, I'm going back home. I hear it's better now. You, you stay and, and, and start your life over again. You know how that goes. You know the story. And Orpah will stay, but uh, Ruth will go with her. And now Ruth, who had married the immigrant, she becomes the immigrant. And you know the great line, you know, I will go with you and your people, my people, your God, my God, and all this kind of stuff, right? I will die with you. Read the narrative because Naomi doesn't say a word. That's interesting. You would think she would go, oh, thank you so much. We can do this together. You keep reading the narrative at the end of chapter 1. And Naomi comes, and the people come out of the town. They're weeping, and they're hugging her. And she says, I'm a bitter woman. I've lost everything in Moab. Where's Ruth in that scene? The Moabite. 
probably off in a corner somewhere, not really knowing what to do. <laughs> She's from that place. No one even says a word. Chapter 2, she's in the field. She has the right to do this by the law. And then Boaz shows up. Oh, who's that woman over there? And I remember hearing sermons. Oh, she must have been a really beautiful woman. That's why. Well, maybe. But maybe she was dressed funny. He spots her. There's the foreign woman. Who is that woman? She's a Moabite. Don't even know her name. She's with uh, Naomi. And she's been working all day. Hasn't taken a break. Listen to the words. They don't know her name. They just know that she works. And she hasn't rested all day. Look at your landscapers. Give me their names. Oh, those Mexicans, they sure work hard. Nameless workers who work their lives to the bone. He calls her over. She comes over and she says, oh, and she bows to the ground. Oh, I'm a nokria. The kind of pejorative term. Why she use the pejorative term? Because maybe she's just feeling marginalized. And you can see how the story works. She has to win her mother-in-law, which is always another story. <laughs> she has to win over the townswomen and, and, and the men, and, and, and you know, now maybe Boaz. And I'm not going to go into all the details. Get to chapter 4, and you know, they, they, they end up marrying, and the men of the town praise her. and The women say to her, you know, she loves you more than seven sons. And Naomi doesn't say a word. But they hand her the child. She takes the child. Because they say, when he grows up, he will take care of you. See, it's the children that become the bridge. It's happening in this country. It's the children. Do you hear the pulsing? And the interesting thing is, is that from this marriage of a Moabite and someone from Bethlehem, there's a son born, it's Obed, the half-breed. I am Obed. No one understands. But yo soy obed. I didn't have to live through what my mother lived through. I speak English without an accent. I can do Spanish. But my mother went through hell. I'm obed. You see how this would work in an immigrant church? And then this son of a migrant woman of a people that Israel despised is now in the lineage of David. A poor peasant immigrant woman is the mother of a whole line of people. Isn't that an interesting story? One more, because there's a panel. Daniel. Daniel's a great story. Have you thought of Daniel as an immigrant story? Think about it. He's taken away before Jerusalem falls. You know the history. So from afar, he watches Babylon, which is where he is, invade and destroy his country. They burn the temple to the ground. Thousands are killed. Probably his family and his friends. The fact that he was so literate means he was probably from a well-to-do family. His family would have lost Everything. Do you hear how hard it would be? How do you serve that? And then what they do is they give them another name. In the ancient world, that's how we own you. We're going to change your name because now you belong to us. 
has happened to slaves? I mean, just change the name, because we own you. And then they begin to train him in all the Babylonian ways. What they're trying to do is reprogram him to be a Babylonian. And a lot of that learning would come through their religious literature. What were Daniel's emotions? Was it humiliation? Was it anger at having to serve the very people that destroyed everything we are and have taken away everything that I have? And now they say they own me and want me to serve them. You ever thought about it that way? What do powerless people do? We see this with the African American community. You negotiate space. What's the only space he's got left? The food. That's all the space he's got. They negotiate it, and things work out well. But if you know culture, Food is a cultural marker. Let me tell you a story. I tell a story, in it, but it's a good one. In Guatemala, we eat black beans. We do black beans any way you want. <laughs> we can do uh, frijol parado, which is the whole bean. We can do arroz con, con frijol. We can do beans and rice. We can do sopa de frijol, you know, bean soup. We can do frijol volteado, which is where you, you mash them and you flip them over. That's why it's volteado. And, and you know, you've had frijol volteado in Guatemala. And it looks like a meatloaf, and then you slice it, or you scoop it, and then you put it on your plate, and then you put some, you know, white uh, goat cheese that's dried, and then you put some salsita on it. And as a kid, when I would go to school in Guatemala, you know, the snack was pan con frijol, a bean sandwich. So I would take students from Denver every other year to, to Guatemala and say, you know, in Guatemala we're going to have... Beans, los tres tiempos. Because it's going to be breakfast and lunch and dinner. <laughs> you know. And with beans, you kind of, you got to get in training for this, because beans do stuff, you know. <laughs> oh, that's your girl. It's okay, you know. We, we go to Cadobas. We go to Chipotle. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they would come in on a Saturday night. I would already be there. And it was classic, because it was always Wednesday morning. That's when things would begin to happen. Oh, Dr. Carol, for the love of God, can we go to McDonald's? <laughs> you know where the McDonald's is. It was the food. Now, in my cruel moments, what I would do, the, uh, because right outside the seminary gate, there's a uh, Domino's pizza, a walk-in, not a sit-down. And so years ago, this has changed now, sadly, because I can't do it anymore. Um, it's probably the only place in the world you could eat black bean pizza. So... Uh, I would say, you know, we're going to do pizza in a, in a movie tonight. Oh, that sounds all, that's all awesome. Yeah, and I'll treat, I'll treat the pizza. You know, so I'd watch, I'd have them watch uh, my Greek, my fat Greek wedding, whatever it's called, which is hilarious, but it's a wonderful cultural study. And I'd bring in the pizzas. Now, the top one would be the, the special one, and the others were kind of regular ones, right? Pepperoni and stuff. But just to watch their face when I would open that first one. <laughs> Bean pizza, anyone? <laughs> and if you read the story, you begin to see that, you see, their food was related to their faith. You may take away my name. You've taken everything I have away from me. You've probably killed my family and my friends. But I am still a Jew. And I will die for my faith as an immigrant. Have you read Daniel? Latinamente. This resonates. Because the life of an immigrant is the constant negotiation of loss loss of your language. Loss of your food, loss of your friends, loss of your family, loss of your dignity, the loss of the nonverbal language, the warmth, the abrazos, the kisses on the cheek. Now you get sued for that in this country. 
you're constantly negotiating loss and you're watching it in your children. And now you have to defend who you are to your own children. And you go to a Latino church and the parents are speaking Spanish, the kids are speaking English. The parents will talk to the child in Spanish and they'll answer in English. How does that work at home? That is the life of living Latinamente. And that is what redirects biblical studies. Do you hear the commitments involved? Future prospects. And two things I want to mention. Two things. And then we can move to the panel. However, that's, I guess we move chairs around or something. OK. I'd say two things. The danger is for the Latino biblical scholar to disconnect himself from the cotidiano. You see this all the time, where you'll see um, a Latino, because of a full-ride scholarship, will go to a mainline seminary and do contextual theology and just gets totally off schedule. And they begin to have this contextualized you know, theology discourse, which is totally disconnected from real life, but it works in the guild, and it gets them jobs. And it's kind of cutting edge, but it's just not people. Maybe you see that in African American circles too. Where you go, that's not what we do in the black church. <laughs> but it'll play at SBL. The flip side of it is you get co opted by the guild. How does that happen? Well, what happens is you'll hire a Latino prof. You fill the slot. <clears throat> I don't know how it works here, so this is all hypothetical, OK? But nothing ever changes, because you want things to stay the same, but you got the face. This happens with blacks all the time. The culture doesn't change, but we got the blacks. The students, we, got, we have some blacks, and, and we, do the, we do the demographic numbers. Another way that um, can get co-opted is you make a center for like Hispanic studies, which is good. But then what you do is, oh yeah, we do that. But you know what, they do it over there. In the real stuff, we do other things. But they, they do that over there. And what you begin to realize is that we need those other voices. And let me close with this, and then it's time for the panel. First Peter, we are all strangers in a strange land. You, what you see is migration becomes a central metaphor for what it means to be a Christian. Because a migrant knows what it means to be strange. The language, the customs, how you dress, all these, they know what it means to be strange. What happens to us, though, is this place is no longer strange. We kind of like it. <laughs> and we want to keep the strangers out. And somehow it's all backwards. And I don't know about you, but this country is getting stranger all the time. And maybe we need them to tell us what it means now to be a stranger in a strange land. When I speak to Latino churches, I say, La Iglesia Angla nos necesita. The Anglo Church needs us. Reading Latinamente, there it is.